so what we've seen so far is one reason to be suspicious of the relativist explanation of disagreement. So it's a reason to think, well, maybe not all is totally well with the relativist explanation. But now we're going to change tack and we're going to see what can be said on behalf of the contextualist. Because whether or not it's true that relativism satisfactorily explains disagreement, we still have a challenge to contextualism. They still have to say, how is it coherent to have disagreements about knowledge when you have different standards from the person you're disagreeing with? And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this premise that I mentioned earlier, this strong disagreement premise. So remember what that said was that when you have two parties who are disagreeing with each other, there has to be some proposition that one of them is asserting and the other one is denying, where denying is just to assert the negation of the other proposition. So we said that that principle is, does initially look like a plausible one. There are various examples we could appeal to to motivate the idea that, it's, that it is a good principle. But we're going to drill down into it now and we're going to see some reasons to think that, well, maybe certain cases work like this, but it might not be true that as a general rule, this is what it takes to have a disagreement or that this is a necessary, that strong disagreement places a necessary condition on disagreement. The main piece of evidence for this comes from what are taken to be called uh, metalinguistic negotiations. And the idea here is that it looks like we can just find cases, examples, that are nothing to do with the, the, the disputed vocabulary, that don't have anything to do with knowledge, where on the one hand, it is intuitively right that the parties are having a disagreement, but it doesn't look like there's some proposition that they're thereby having a disagreement over. So I'm going to give you two examples. Um, one is this sort of famous one that the philosopher Peter Ludlow came up with. It's based on this radio survey that he overheard, which was like a list of the greatest athletes of all time. And in this survey, Secretariat, who was a racing horse, was one of the top athletes in this survey. And this prompted a disagreement because one obvious reaction is, how could he be one of the greatest athletes of all time? Because he's not a person, he's a horse. How can, per how can a horse be an athlete? And the observation was that there seemed to be some sort of disagreement here about whether Secretariat was an athlete. And you can imagine you can actually explicitly turn this into a disagreement if you want. So imagine Alice asserts Secretariat is an athlete. Not only is he an athlete, he's one of the greatest athletes there ever have been. And Billy claims, no, Secretariat is not an athlete. He can't be an athlete. He's a person. So on the one hand, you might think it looks like there is some kind of disagreement happening. Alice and Billy are not just talking past each other in the way that they would be if one of them was saying, for instance, I'm hungry, and the other one was saying, I'm not hungry. This looks different from that case. On the other hand, is there a proposition that they're both disagreeing about? Well, we can just stipulate as part of the case, and as is part of the actual world case that ins inspired this, that we agree on all the basic facts about Secretariat. We agree that he won all these races in, in such and such times, and we can imagine Alice and Billy know all these things as well. They know all the facts about Secretariat. Nonetheless, there seems to be this disagreement. So one position that's tempting to some people is that there's no proposition they're really disagreeing about in the sense that we normally disagree about propositions because they agree on all the facts. Rather, what's going on is they're having a disagreement about whether to count Secretariat as an athlete or they're having a disagreement about whether the word athlete properly applies to Secretariat. And the thought for why this might be happening is just because when you look at the cases, a natural reaction might be, well, they agree on all the facts, or at least they agree on all the first order facts about Secretariat. So they must be disagreeing about something else, like whether to count him as an athlete or whether he's properly described as an athlete, whether we should use the word athlete to talk about Secretariat. If that's the right description of the case, then this clearly would be a disagreement, but not one where we're disagreeing about a proposition. Rather, what we're disagreeing about seems to be 
whether somebody counts as something or whether to use the word in a certain way to describe someone, to describe Secretariat as an athlete. That's one case, but let me give you one more case, which is even simpler. So we said a few weeks ago that it's pretty much generally agreed that the word tall um, is a context sensitive word. When I say tall, I might mean tall for an adult, a child, a basketball player. There are lots of different things I might mean tall with respect to. Now, of course, I don't spell this out. The way it works is I let the context fill in the details of what particular sense of tall I'm using. But notice that at least in some cases where different people have different things in mind, it looks like there still can be some kind of disagreement. So imagine Alice and Billy are talking about this person, Jonathan. He's just an ordinary guy. And Alice says, uh, Jonathan is tall. And now imagine Billy says, no, Jonathan isn't tall. LeBron James, now there's somebody who's tall. For those of you who don't know, LeBron James is an American basketball player, famously really big guy. So on the one hand, it does feel like there's something like a disagreement going on here. When Billy see it says, no, Jonathan isn't tall, LeBron James is tall, he's not really quite talking past Alice in the way that we saw can happen in earlier cases. Now, you might think he's being kind of obtuse or, or something like that, but he's not sort of missing the point of what Alice said, you might think. On the other hand, if we're subscribed to contextualism about tall, Again, it's the case that there's no one proposition that they're agreeing or disagreeing over. Alice is asserting the proposition, Jonathan is tall, you know, for, for an average adult. Whereas Billy is asserting the proposition that Jonathan is not tall relative to the standard of basketball players. And that LeBron James is tall relative to the standard of basketball players. But just as before, these are two compatible things. Jonathan can both be tall for an average person and not tall for a basketball player or by basketball player standards. Those are completely coherent things. But nonetheless, it seems like there's something like of a disagreement going on here. It's at very least true that Billy is not just stating some extra, extra fact. What he's saying is felt to be in tension in somehow with what Alice said. So how might we explain this? We might give a similar diagnosis to what we said in the Secretariat case. Again, what might be going on is not that they're disagreeing about how the world is or what propositions are true, but rather they're disagreeing about how they should use the word tall. Or if we're contextualists, we can say they're disagreeing about what the relevant standard is or what the relevant standard should be. On this model, Alice is starting the conversation by assuming that the standard, the relevant standard for tallness is just average person or average adult. And one thing Billy is doing is he's claiming or communicating that he thinks the relevant standard that they should be operating with is tall for a basketball player. So what they're disagreeing about on this model of what's going on here is not, they're not disagreeing about the propositions that they are using their words to assert, but rather they're saying these things in order to sort of coordinate on a particular standard, a particular way uh, for interpreting the word tall. So this might be another way, a similar way again to the Secretariat case, but a very different kind of way um, to disagree than the one that's, that is given to us by this strong disagreement principle. Okay, so what we just saw was that those were two examples that look like they might be counterexamples to the strong disagreement principle. Because on the one hand, there are cases where there does seem to be some disagreement, because there's some real felt tension between what the speakers are saying. But on the other hand, we saw some arguments to the effect that in both cases, um, it's not true that there's one proposition that one party is asserting and the other person is denying. Rather, they're just asserting different propositions. But the attempted or the, the gesture at explanation for why these might count as disagreement is that even though they're not disagreeing about the propositions, there is some disagreement here about the way the words are being used or the way that they should be used. So even though the different people are saying things that are consistent with each other, they're doing so in a way um, 
that allows them to dis have this sort of higher level disagreement about which way to use the words. So even what they literally express, what they literally assert, is not in tension with each other. They're doing this other kind of thing, um, namely negotiating about the standards to use or, or what to count as an athlete. They're negotiating about, about this other thing by asserting in the ways that they are. So where does this leave the argument for lost disagreement? Well, on the one hand, there's some good news for contextualism. The good news is that the crucial premise, the strong disagreement premise that we were relying on, is undermined if, these, if that's what's going on in these cases. If we've correctly described what's going on in these cases, if we have correctly described what's going on in the Secretariat case and the Tall case, then clearly strong disagreement can't be true. It must be the case that there are some disagreements where the parties are not asserting and denying the same proposition. That's the good news for contextualism. The bad news, or the less good news for contextualism, is that we haven't yet seen any particular reason to think that when it comes to no's, no's is a case like the secretariat case, rather than the ordinary case where we're disagreeing over proposition. Because the point of the counterexamples is not to say that um, disagreement is never over a given proposition. We're not saying that all disagreement is of the model of like secretariat in the tall case. And that would be incredibly implausible. The reason strong disagreement seemed like a plausible principle because, was because it, it does seem to get lots of ordinary cases right. Lots of ordinary cases are cases where we're disagreeing over the one proposition. So what we've seen, is, if these counterexamples are right, is that there are really two different kinds of disagreement. And contextualism has to say that disagreement over knowledge, at least when it comes to skeptics and non-skeptics, falls in the metalinguistic category. But notice we haven't actually seen any evidence for that yet. So we haven't been given any particular reason to think it's true. We could see why the contextualist would want it to be true, because otherwise their view will struggle to explain what's going on. But we haven't seen any independent evidence for what's going on. And this is an important question we need to keep in mind, because even though the argument, this does make the argument a little bit less pressing, there is a still a big question for the contextualist of which category should we think, you know, independently of what theory we hold, which category of disagreement do disagreements about knowledge fall in? Are they disagreements about propositions or are they these metalinguistic disagreements? And what kind of evidence would settle the question one way or the other?